Now, I've got to admit, I'm not so good with economics and the world of finance. The complexities of it are just too confusing. But maybe that's the point. Maybe it's meant to be too confusing for the average person, just like it suited the Catholic Church to keep the Bible too confusing for anyone to understand so that they became the information guardians and could get away with whatever they liked. Maybe it suits bankers to have us ignorant of what they are up to as well. Remember the quotation from the anonymously authored Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars which said, The bookkeeper can be king if the public can be kept ignorant of the methodology of the bookkeeping. In the next couple of parts, I want to highlight how our money markets and banking systems are far more manipulated than we might imagine, and that most things that happen within them happen by design, not by chance. In his book, The Coming Economic Armageddon, which I'd highly recommend, David Jeremiah writes about some puzzling things that happened in the aftermath of the economic crash that hit in 2009. He says that failed institutions such as Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Citibank and Goldman Sachs managed to pay back their billions of dollars in bailout funds early. Then, amazingly, in the first quarter of 2010, not one of these banking giants posted a loss. A virtually impossible feat equivalent to four major league pitchers, each pitching a perfect game on the same day. How was such an astounding turnaround even possible? Was some kind of manipulation going on here? Some suspect it was a pre-planned event. He goes on to say, And then there is the strange case of the stock market flash crash miracle of early May 2010. If you're a market watcher, you may have experienced simultaneously apoplexy and angina as the stock market took a frightening bungee ride that Thursday. Call it panic buying, a plunge, a market correction or some other euphemism, the Dow Jones posted its greatest intraday loss since the crash of 1987. After 2.30pm, in just 5 minutes, the Dow dropped 400 to 800 points. It went on to lose nearly 1,000 points in that precipitous dive. At 2.40pm, the descent stopped with a curious and startling upward jerk as if the bungee cord had reached its nadir and its rider was sent vaulting back up to the apex. By 3.40pm, the Dow had recovered 383.17 points, an almost miraculous recovery in less than an hour. A financial miracle? Maybe not. It would appear there might have been intervention by a behind-the-scenes committee. Again, this isn't my favourite subject, but the economy is so fundamental to what's happening in the world today that we need to cover it. Let's try to understand this a little bit by working through a timeline. Back during the French Revolution in 1790, a man called Meyer Rothschild lived in Frankfurt, Germany, which was the birthplace of the Illuminati, if you'll remember. It has been suggested that the Rothschild family were in fact the financial backers to Adam Weishaupt. The Rothschild family had become incredibly rich by lending money to royalty, particularly Prince William IX of hesse hanau They discovered that lending to governments and monarchies was far more profitable than lending to individuals. The loans were far bigger and they were secured against the taxes of the people, making them relatively risk-free. This practice gave Meyer Rothschild big ideas and around that time he made the bold statement that if he could control a nation's money, he could control the nation, regardless of who the political leader was at the time. Just a year later, in 1791, he put his plans into effect by establishing the first bank of the United States. That bank was given a 20-year charter by the American government through a man called Alexander Hamilton, who had served in George Washington's cabinet. Meyer Rothschild also gave his son, Nathan, £20,000 to establish a central bank in London, England. This became known as the Bank of England. Another son, Jacob or James, was told to do the same in France. Another son, Kalman, set up one in Naples for Italy, and finally, Salomon was sent to do the same in Vienna. Remember John Robinson's word from Proofs of Conspiracy. The primary goal of the Illuminist is to get the possession of riches, power and influence without industry, i.e. without working for it. Well, that's basically what money lenders do. They create money out of thin air, lend it at interest and receive more back without any effort on their part. This is called usury. It was outlawed in the Bible, but today the entire economy is based on it. Let me try to explain. 
This is a moneylender called Meyer, and this is another guy called John. They live in a brand new country called Freeland. Meyer goes to the newly formed government of Freeland and asks to establish a central bank to issue the currency of the country. The central bank will be privately owned and run. The government agrees. Now John decides he wants to build a house here in Freeland, but no money exists yet, so he goes to Meyer at the central bank and asks for 100 Freeland dollars to build it. Meyer gives him that $100 loan, which represents an immediate debt. That paper money basically says, you are in debt by this much. But on top of the $100, Meyer charges John a 10% interest rate which must be paid back over 10 years. That means that in total, John will have to work to pay back $158.40 over 10 years on the original principal debt of $100. The problem is, there's only $100 in circulation because that's all the Central Freeland Bank has printed. So how does John pay back $158.40 when there's only $100 in circulation? More money needs to be printed so that there's enough in circulation to cover the interest. So John goes back to the bank to ask them to print another $58.40 to loan him so that he can pay back the original debt. The bank conjures that $58.40 out of thin air and issues it to John, but at interest. They want 10% over 10 years on that money as well. So he's now in debt to the tune of $192.40. But there's only $158.40 in the system. So John goes back to ask for more to cover the shortfall again. They issue that at interest as well, and so on and so on. Under this system, there is never enough money in the system to pay off all debts. It keeps John in a perpetual state of debt to the bank. The only way he can meet his payments is if the bank issues more, which puts him further into debt. It's a spiral that grows exponentially and will eventually get out of control. John has to work harder and harder to generate more and more money without ever getting the benefit of it himself. The bank owns more and more of his labour, and more and more of his earnings are consumed by the repayments. Eventually John will fall into a state of exhaustion and will have to default on his loan, at which point the bank comes in and takes all his tangible assets, such as the house he has built and the land it sits on. So the bank has given out of this nothingness, these pieces of paper or numbers on a computer screen that are worth nothing to John, and in return they have sucked up all his real solid, tangible assets that have intrinsic worth. They have gained riches without industry, without working for it. In the process they have also made a slave out of John who has worked all his days trying to keep up with repayments. They have been parasites on his life. They have been getting richer in the process and leaving him with less and less. That's effectively what is happening in the world today, except the government is a middleman between the bank and John, John being us, the people. Governments borrow money from privately owned central banks who charge them interest for the privilege. The governments are then instantly in debt, and because the debt has compound interest on it, they need the central bank to issue more money to cover that interest, which they do, also at interest, and the whole thing gets into a spiral. There is never enough money in the system, and there never can be. It was designed that way, because it means that, that way we can never be debt-free. Never being debt-free keeps us in slavery to the banks. The government then charges their citizens more and more tax to try and keep up with the interest payments to the banks. This means the citizens have to work harder and harder with less and less personal reward. With the sweat of their brow they generate goods and services to sell, only for increasing amounts of their income to be vacuumed up in taxes and debt repayments through the system to the central bank. The citizens become impoverished and enslaved and the central bank grows wealthier and fatter. A two-tier system is created like that proposed by Plato. Those at the top get richer and the rest get poorer. In the meantime, as the debt spirals, we need to work more, sell more, generate more, consume more. Our businesses try to find new markets, expand into new territories, consuming and destroying more and more of the Earth's resources on the way. 
people in the new markets might not need what we're selling, but we need to sell it to them. So we need to convince them that they need it. Consumerism and materialism spirals out of control. Adverts lie and tell us we need their thing to make us happy. And then when we buy it, they release a newer, better version a year later. And then they tell us we need that one instead. At times, the bank issues credit freely to encourage the spending spiral, and then, when they feel like it, when everyone is loaded with debt, they can contract the money supply, cause a depression in the economy which causes millions of citizens to default on home payments or car payments, all the stuff they've been buying but haven't really been able to afford, at which point the bank steps in and takes control of those hard, valuable assets, and the people are left in poverty. The endless growth that means new money has to be constantly pumped into the system also means the currency becomes increasingly worthless. This is called inflation. A couple of generations ago, one parent could go out to work and provide more than enough for a family of five. Today, two parents working sometimes barely cover the cost of living. Nothing in nature indulges in endless growth like this except for cancer, and that is far from healthy. Left unchecked, it causes death to its host. Likewise, there is not a single civilization in history that based its economic system on usury that didn't collapse into an exhausted heap in the end. There is no escape from it. That will happen to us too. Our whole economic system is headed for a huge collapse, and when it does, the elite money men will step in to snap up the valuable resources and consolidate global assets in the hands of a few. This would create a global two-tier system. What we have felt thus far are only tremors. There is something much bigger ahead. Remember the moment in Matthew 21 when Jesus arrived in the temple and found the moneylenders there. He got about as angry as Jesus is ever recorded to have been. He knocks over their tables and chases them out of there, calling them a den of thieves. That's what usury is. It's theft. In Proverbs 22.7, the Bible says that the rich rule over the poor, the borrower is a slave to the lender. We are all slaves to central banks now, which is why we are taxed at every turn. Our government is slave to those bankers too. They form a shadow government, just like Mayor Rothschild boasted about in 1790. Democracy is an illusion under this system. Most of us will also have car repayments, mortgages, or will have taken out credit on some other large purchase. It has been reported that Americans today now pay more tax than 19th century slaves and medieval serfs. If the borrower is slave to the lender, are any of us really free? Or did we just come to love our servitude because it was comfortable, like Aldous Huxley suggested we would? I've done my best to explain as far as I can understand, but like I said, economics isn't my forte at all. So what I've done is copied links to a few websites below that should help explain the situation in black and white. I should add I don't necessarily agree with everything on those pages and in those sites, but it will give you a good idea of what's going on. Finally, although my financial advice is admittedly worth very little, I would suggest that as our paper money becomes increasingly worthless and may one day soon collapse completely, it might be an idea to invest in something with real value, such as gold or silver. We should also try to pay off our private debts as soon as possible and to live as debt-free as we possibly can.